random things. So I entitled the sermon, A Little Dis, A Little Dat, all right? So, um, I, and I'll tell you why I'm calling it this. It's kind of, kind of like a mod podge of a whole bunch of things that I want to, I want to, uh, I feel led by the Lord to, to share. Um, but question first, what is the best place to get breakfast in Linden? On the count of three, everybody shout it out, your answer. One, two, three. Okay, there you go. So there you go. Have that. Um, you know, it's, it's up for debate, right? Rustlers, Fairway Cafe, the Dutch Treat. The Dutch Treat, that used to be called something else, right? Was, or is it always the Dutch Treat? Always, okay. Oh, yeah, Rustlers was called something else. That was it, yeah. Well, I want to tell, tell you something about the best place in a small town. It's this little place called Neighbor's Cafe. Look at this place. Like, I don't know if you can go in there and eat or get your life taken away from you, but that... <laughs> Like, that is, that is like my hometown, McPherson, Kansas. This was the place that, like, if you wanted to get breakfast, you go to this place. It used to be called the Chuck Wagon, and they changed it to Neighbor's Cafe. It's probably a little bit more appealing, but just a couple places to sit. It reminds me of the Dutch treat, just like a couple little tables, very laid back, and, you know, you get your food and you enjoy it. Uh, but today what I want to talk about is is kind of that small town menu, uh, and it was so funny, as you look at the menu, they literally had, it said, a little this, a little that. There's just a little bit of this, a little bit of that, you never know what's going to be on the menu, but it's a little this, a little that, and so it's just a whole bunch of random stuff. Today, we're going to cover a little bit of this and a little bit of that, but at the end, what I really want to make sure that we all get is the cinnamon roll. The cinnamon roll at Neighbors Cafe is absolutely amazing. I promise you, you've never had a better one. And everybody has their cinnamon roll place, right? But I promise you, Neighbors Cafe or the old chuck wagon, it has the best one. I'm going to show you a picture of it here in a little bit. And my sister can attest to this. All my buddies in high school, you can attest to this as well. Um, Me and my buddies used to go there early morning, like once a week, and hold each other accountable and eat cinnamon rolls, and then try to go learn from school, right? But um, anyway, um, I want to talk a little bit about this and that today. And so really kind of the way I patterned the message is, is kind of appetizer, main course, and then dessert. I want to make sure that we save room for dessert at the end. So let's go ahead and pray. Lord, I pray that as we go through this message, which is kind of like a, a little bit of this and a little bit of that, and there's a whole bunch to, to talk about as we begin um, entering into this new year, I know that we're a month into it already, but there's a whole bunch of things that you need, to, you need to say to us, I feel, and so I pray that you would certainly be our teacher now. May you add your blessing and, read, uh, and, and to those who hear and to those who read and then those who obey these instructions that you give to us this morning in various passages of Scripture. And so may you be pleased in our learning and then also in our obeying and doing. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So if you go out for breakfast... The first thing that you do is you order a cup of coffee, right? Am I right? No? Yes, I am, all right? <laughs> you got it. like, in, in breakfast, there's really no appetizer, you know. Usually, it's just like, I'm going to start off with a cup of coffee. Um, the closest thing to an appetizer is really just kind of like a cup of coffee. And what I love about it is that first sip, as long as it's not like 1,000 degrees, right, it indicates that you're there. It's like, okay, something good is going to be coming, right? Um, you're getting ready to take in some deliciousness that you didn't have to do anything to make. You just said, you know, your wish is my command. I want, you know, pancakes today. And all of a sudden, within 15 minutes, pancakes show up. Like, the coffee is kind of like the appetizer indicating to you, like, hey, good things are in store. Good things are coming. Um, the first sip kind of begins the festivities. Have you guys watched the Olympics at all? Do any of you watch the Olympics? Okay, the lighting of the torch, it, torch, it like symbolizes, okay, the games can now begin, okay? So the this of the message or the dis of the message is more of an appetizer today, but it's something that I also shared briefly about at our annual celebration a few months back, but I want to expand on it a bit with you here now. Look at this passage of scripture from the prophet Isaiah. He says this, remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Well, what's the context of this? Well, the context of this passage of Scripture is Isaiah's prophecy about God's plan of action that no one can reverse or stop. He is going to bring about his plan of salvation, 
And we can know it and know it with certainty because of what he has successfully carried out in the past. Okay, Isaiah is going to point to a time where Israel was delivered by God at the Exodus. And the Exodus of Israel from Egypt is like the defining moment of showcasing God's ability to carry out his plans in the Old Testament. So all these authors in the Old Testament go back and they always point back to, hey, remember when we were in Egypt. Remember, 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 remember. So that's what Isaiah is going to talk about. Remember not the former things, but he's going to highlight the fact that then he's going to tell them to remember the former things. It's kind of strange, but this is interesting. He's going to point back to that story and look at verse 16. He says, thus saith the Lord, who makes a way in the sea, a path in the mighty waters, who brings forth chariots and horse, army and warriors. They lie down, they cannot rise, they are extinguished, quenched like a wick. So here's verse 16. Isaiah says, remember when God delivered Israel. Remember, they passed through the mighty waters. And then verse 17, remember when God defeated the army that was chasing after them. In fact, it's very poetic, he extinguished them like a quenched wick. So he likens Pharaoh and all of his armies to like this little candle, and then he's going to dump the Red Sea on them, and I think the the Red Sea is going to win, right? He's going to extinguish the enemies, the foes of God's people. So this is what Isaiah is going to point back to. And he wants to establish God's ability in the past, but then almost say, now let's not dwell on that. In fact, let's almost as if, let's forget about that. Let's learn the lesson from it, but forget about dwelling in the past because I am going to do a new thing. So then you get verse 18 and 19. Remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old, because I'm going to be doing a new thing. So that makes me ask the question, Isaiah, what new thing are you talking about? What new thing is God going to be doing? What is he going to be bringing about? What plans does God have in mind? Well, ultimately, what this is forecasting and foreseeing is a time when a greater deliverance was going to be coming for God's people. There is going to be a greater exodus coming that would open up a whole new door of possibilities, a whole new world of new things and new possibilities for God's people. You could almost call it that there is a new creation coming. So let me ask you people that know your Bible pretty well, I think, right? Who is the ultimate deliverer who is presented to us as the Lamb of God whose blood we can paint over the proverbial doorways of our lives so that we might be saved from the wrath to come. Does anybody want to take an educated stab at it? Who is it? Good, yes. We're at a good church where the good pastor teaching you good things, right? Yes. We'll just attribute it. It's all good Sunday school teaching. That's where it came from, right? Jesus, right? Yes, Jesus. The sacrifice of Jesus, according to the author of Hebrews, says, made perfect forever those who are being made holy, as it says in Hebrews 10, 14. Jesus provides us with a deliverance, and then he makes us, quote unquote, new creations and starts doing a, quote, new thing in us and through us that the world can observe. That's what Isaiah was was forecasting and foreseeing, that God was going to bring a greater deliverance and bring about a new thing. So reflecting on this reality, Paul picks up on this concept as we we preach through the book of Ephesians with these two verses. Ephesians 2.10. He's going to establish the theology of this first. For we are his workmanship. we've We've been crafted together. He's been doing a work on us. And we've been created, we've been brought into existence in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should then walk in them. So he's going to establish the theological concept as God is going to do this new thing by creating a new person out of you in Jesus Christ and say, then I want you to walk in this way. So then Paul flips the script and goes to chapter 4 and says this, I therefore, as a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. 
Because there is a new thing that God is bringing about in the world and you are a part of it. And you must, you've been created for this and you must walk in accordance with that calling that has been laid upon your life if you are regenerate and in Christ Jesus. The church is the body of Christ. So that which the church does Whatever the church, quote-unquote, walks in are the, quote-unquote, new things that God is doing in the world. And all of us get to be a part of it. To bring about the new creation that God is bringing into the world because we are new creations. I mentioned this before, but there was all this talk about what's essential, what's social, like in our world, is like, what is essential, what do we need? The church is the one and only essential social service in the world. The church is the only one. I'm not saying it to be political, but I'm just saying we are the tangible expression of Jesus Christ to the world. Jesus says you are the light of the world, so let your light shine. And then go, go walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you've received. We are essential to the world. We are the new things that God is bringing about, the good works that we find ourselves conducting ourselves in is essential for the world. We are the tangible expression of the body of Christ, are we not? These verses should wake you from your slumber. They should be like that first warm sip of caffeine at a restaurant informing you that there is a feast that has been prepared for you in the back and the wait staff is getting ready to come and offer you that goodness and set it right down in front of you and say, enjoy. We must waken up to these things. We are the body of Christ. We must walk in the good works that he's prepared for us to walk in. God is doing a new thing, and he wants you to be awakened to it and participate in it. So may that be like that first sip of coffee when you sit down in a restaurant, informing you of greater things to come. So now let's move on to the main course at Neighbor's Cafe. And today, we're going to order the biscuits and gravy, all right? They are amazing there. Oh my goodness. If you ever want to wake up on a Saturday and want nothing else to do for the rest of the day, go to Neighbor's Cafe and order a full order of the biscuits and gravy, okay? I dare you, <laughs> you know? Um, if you do, the waiter or waitress will, will ask you when your five other buddies are going to help you finish it, right? There's so much. There's no way that you're going to be able to finish it and talk about it and live to talk about it, right? You heard of stick to your ribs food. This is like stick all over your body food, right? <laughs> It's like, it's, uh, you feel horrible after you eat it, but it tastes so good, right? I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not a spokesperson. I'm not getting any perks from saying this, but if Neighbors Cafe, if you want to throw something my way when I come back to Kansas at some point, let's go for it. If you, if you order the biscuits and gravy, the full order, you will regret your decision. There's really too much to take in. You better order half in order to be productive with the rest of your Saturday, but at our men's advance, I want to talk about kind of um, the main course of, of the message here today. At our men's advance or retreat um, that I was shared out a week ago, I spoke about a whole host of spiritual disciplines um, that have been given to us by God, habits of grace for us to be able to grow in, to grow. Um, Paul tells Titus in chapter 2, verse 12, that we are to live godly and upright lives in this present age. Your life should look different. And it's not up to you necessarily. It's up to God's grace that has been given to you. And then you react to that grace. And that grace actually trains us to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives. I talked about various spiritual disciplines or habits of grace that really need to be in all of our lives, slotted in intentionally into our lives so that we won't be ineffective and unproductive in our knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, as Peter writes in 2 Peter, like you need to do something with your faith, with your walk. So, we talked a lot about Bible reading and prayer and fasting and a whole bunch of other spiritual disciplines that have been given for us to grow. Some of you are neglecting these normal, common things. 
and you're wondering why you're not growing. And I'm saying you're neglecting the most basic aspect of God has given you his word. God has given you the medium and the way to communicate with him through prayer, right? One little side note of application. I was having a conversation with, with somebody, um, even coming back from the, the retreat, advance, sorry. And, and they were saying, um, daily prayer with my wife is like the lifeline to our relationship. And it just struck me as like, man, I do pray with my wife every day, but usually it's like, like little things, you know, or just like quick before meal or like right before we go to bed or whatever. And, and I, that just struck me. I'm just sitting there and I'm just thinking, man, is that the lifeline to my relationship? And I think, you know, a point of application is husbands and wives, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just suck the awkwardness right out of the room, okay? If you're not praying together every day, you need to. If you're not praying, uh, so, uh, you might feel like, man, you just nailed me. Okay, I nailed you. That's great, but let's, okay, it's okay. Let's just acknowledge that. Now, take the awkwardness out. Husbands and wives, go home and pray together. Pray together. Is it going to be awkward? Yes, because you haven't done it for a while. That's fine. Don't worry about that. Just do it. Open up, open up the Bible and just like, maybe just read one verse or one paragraph and it's okay. Let's pray about these things that we learn. And see how that begins to transform your daily life. Do it. Do it. Don't let that awkwardness or the weirdness stand in your way. Just go ahead and do it. You know, there's that little song that we sing to our kids. Read your Bible. You ever heard that one? Pray every day. Pray every day. Pray every day. Read your, and you'll what? Grow, grow, grow. Neglect your Bible. Forget to pray. What happens? And you'll Shrink, 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 right? Like it's, like, it's so basic, right? So basic. These normal, common, everyday things for Christians to engage in daily. And if you engage in them, they will produce a return on investment that is anything but normal or common. You, if you engage in these things and invest in these things, you will have experienced communion with God. And that is what you were created in the first place to experience. The main course the biscuits and gravy of the Christian life is wrapped up in a Greek word, and it's the Greek word koinonia. It's the word for fellowship. The essence of the Christian life is based off this idea of fellowship, first with God and then with other fellow believers in Christ. In the beginning, Adam was placed in the garden to enjoy friendship and communion with God. And God says, that's amazing, but it's not good for you to be alone, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to create a custom fit match for you. And so Adam, he was given Eve, right? And he's like amazed by this, this relationship, this fellowship, this communion, so they could in, experience intimate fellowship with each other, fellowship outside of biblical forgiveness. There might not be anything else that Christians talk about more but actually practice less. We love the idea of forgiveness until we have something to forgive because it's gut-wrenching. And so then we often talk about forgiveness, but then we withhold extending it to those who are in need. Same thing with fellowship. We love the idea of fellowship, but we might be in danger of loving it in form only, but deny its function in our lives because it also can be gut-wrenchingly difficult to do what biblical fellowship really is. Some of you are assuming the form of fellowship, right? You're here this morning, or you came to Equipping Hour, you joined a life group, or whatever it might be. Maybe you go to what all the, these, all these forms of fellowship, and I say, well, good for you. You got the form down. But is it possible that you're denying the power of the function of fellowship? Could it be that there's an appearance of godliness, but you actually might be denying its power, like Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.15, having an appearance of godliness, but denying its power. Avoid such people. The people that have the form down, but are neglecting the function of the form. So, let me explain a few things, and I explained some of these things to the men at Men's Advance. All of us in this room 
have been gifted with something that really is truly amazing. In fact, you have it with you right now. I think everybody does. This gift that you've been given, that you have on your person right now, gives great dexterity and ability to grip things and manipulate tools to do our bidding. What am I talking about? I'm talking about your thumb, right? If you have one, give me a thumbs up. All right, good job. You all have this amazing gift, right? You, if you have a gift, if you have, so give me a thumbs up. You got it? Okay, I just want to make sure. Okay, some people don't have thumbs. I, I feel really bad for them. Um, they're really useful. Having an opposable thumb is amazing, right? But if we have it in form only, but we never use it to grab something or to hitchhike, or to say good job or bad job to somebody, what's the point, right? You have the form of a thumb, but you're neglecting its function in your life. It should be utilized in grasping things and and, and saying good job to people, right? We might be in danger of having the form of fellowship down, but we might actually be denying its function. So how? Well, the function of Christian fellowship is based on intimacy and authenticity, And really, honestly, nothing probably scares us more than really being known by our brothers and sisters because what if they see the real me and they don't like me or they judge me or they they reject me? That potential reality is way too scary for me and I just, I don't want to go there, so I'll just go to things like church gatherings or my life group or to Bible studies or retreats and, and not really let anyone in through the tough exterior to see the real me. I'll just kind of, I'll, I'll do the form of fellowship. True Christian fellowship, listen to this people, turns our lives into an open book that can be read by anyone else in the community. In true Christian fellowship, We are truly seen, warts and all, and guess what? All of us have warts. It's just that some of us have learned to apply makeup in a way to hide our warts and our our shortcomings from the community to see who we really are. True Christian fellowship is a tool that the Lord has given to his church so that our needs and our shortcomings can be made known and then worked on. Look at this beautiful passage of scripture in the book of Acts. As the church is initiated, God is going to do this new thing, and the, the, new, the people who are, who are associated with Christ and following the teachings of Christ were called people of the way, and these are the way, this is the way the people of the way conducted themselves, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers, and all came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were there together and had all things in common. And listen to this. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. They exposed the need and said, let me go. Let me be, because I'm devoted to that. Let me go and be part of that need in your life. This is a beautiful picture These people were devoted to one another and willing to meet the needs that were apparent within their fellowship. The only way that they could meet that need is if a need is known, and the only way a need can be known is if that person opens up and shares a little bit. Hey, I have this issue. Whether it's a physical issue or a spiritual issue or emotional, I ha- this is who I am. I got this sin issue. You need to see it so that I need the light of Christ to shine on it through you so that we can work on this together. There are many here, there are many here who are claiming to be part of the fellowship, but have done so in form only and not in function. So when it's one of the worst weeks of your lives, and you've erupted like a volcano on those in your family, and then you go to church and somebody asks you how you're doing, you say, great, (laughs) really, great. After the worst week of your life, that's you, great. Well, maybe they're, maybe they, they're, you know, they know Jesus better than I do, right? Really? Great. Well, add lying to your list then, right? 
If you think it's okay to lose it on your family, those whom God has given you to love unconditionally, if that's the case, if you think it's okay to do that and it's great, then you can add foolishness to your list as well, right? Christian fellowship means that we expose that which is ugly about us so that God can use his people to shine some light in there. Shine some light on that ugliness so that we can look at it and begin working to make that which is ugly beautiful in the context of a safe relationship. Christian fellowship. True Christian fellowship means that we're transparent and vulnerable with one another so that we can be fortified and strong together. But so often because we fear man more than God, we fail to really engage in Christian fellowship and we have the form down but we deny its function. Christian fellowship cannot just be a glorified hangout time with the saints. It's intentional time set aside to engage each other with gospel-centered encouragements and admonitions to live our lives on mission for Jesus. I was sharing with somebody through text message, I said "There's, there's no lone ranger Christians, at least not for very long. You're a sitting duck for the devil if you're that. I said you're an easy target for the adversary. You're a snack for the devil who is prowling around seeking someone to devour. So I said don't be a meal for the devil. Why don't you share a meal with your brothers and sisters in Christ in Holy Communion? David Mathis says true Christian fellowship is less like friends gathered to watch the Super Bowl And more like the players on the field in blood and sweat and tears huddled in the backfield only in preparation for the next down. That's fellowship. Sitting on a couch and watching, you know, that's not, that's that's cool, I love it. If anyone wants to invite me to their Super Bowl party, I'll come, maybe. Yeah, depends on what you're serving, no. Um, You know, I'm talking about like, okay, what's going on in your life? Show me, show me where there's some ugliness and let me, let me help you. Let me come alongside you and pray for you and care for you, right? We do life together. Life groups is what they're called, right? So what I just shared with you is the full portion of the biscuits and gravy, and it's a lot to digest. But let me switch analogies and get down into the nuts and bolts of how this works best here in our fellowship. I want you to know this. You will not grow on your own. So I want to talk about some fellowship opportunities, okay? So there's just a whole bunch of stuff like on the screen, all right, that, that we, we do as a church for ways that you can be connected with what we do. First of all, I'm going to give you all permission to pull out your smartphone if you have it, all right? You can pull this out. It's okay. If you want to tune me out for the next minute or two, that's okay because I want you to open up the Church Center app if you have it and update your information. This when we talk about prayer being like a lifeline to your spouse, like this, this is a means of communication for us to you, and it's the Church Center app. You can see it up there on the top left. If you don't know how to get on there, please reach out to Erica Berdan, our office administrator. She will get you set up. Um, you know, sometimes people joke about this. You know, they say, well, it's not, the relationship's not official until it's Facebook official, right? Some of you are in our system, but you're not married to your spouse, I'm like, oh my goodness, we need to come alongside and church discipline you. No, like, like you're not married, you're not linked together, right? I'm like, no, just say you're married, that'd be great, you know? And then we can know that you're married, right? And we don't try to hook you up with somebody else, all right? So, <laughs> so, so church center, like, just, just update your information. If you have more kids, like, put your kids in there. Like, we need to get the, like, update your information and email addresses, those types of things. Totally, totally do that. We have a communication that goes out every week called the Spirit of Faith. And weekend updates, videos about where we sit down and we talk about um, what's going to be happening in the upcoming worship gathering so you can prepare yourself for it. We also have a podcast that we put out every week called the Review Preview where we look back at what we talked about in the message times, or all things FCC, and then preview what's going to be happening in the week to come. Danny was on this last week. It's awesome. It's great ways for you to get in touch and fellowship with what's happening here at FCC. We have equipping hour. We have Bible studies. We have student ministries. Some of you have kids or grandkids that are just feeling like they're isolated and lonely. Send them to Danny. Send them to our student ministries and let them receive the love and nourishment and care from Christian fellowship and good teaching there. We have life groups. We have men's advance. We just went on a weekend to go, ladies, your retreat is coming up in March. Sign up for it. Yeah, it might be awkward. It might not be your thing. Just go try it. Go do it. It's a, it, it, I think you'll be blessed by it. You have to open yourself up a little bit to be connected. 
So do that. Everyone here is a counselor. There's that Caring Like Christ seminar that we're going to be putting on for a whole community. Other churches are invited to this because people desperately need to be cared for the way Christ cares for them. And he does that through his people. Paul writes to the Romans. He says, I, I'm confident, I'm, I'm, I'm proud of you, I'm, that you're filled with goodness and filled with all sorts of knowledge that you are able to instruct one another. We need to be people that can sit down with other people and instruct them in the ways of Christ. I had eight counseling sessions this last week. I had eight, and I had a ninth reach out to me, and I'm going to meet with this person next week. This is all amazing, but it's also all overwhelming. There's a lot of needs, and they don't all have to come to the senior pastor for these things. They can come to you. They're, they're running to help. They're running to find solutions for their problem, and they're coming to the right place. But it doesn't have to be me. It could be any of us as we connect these people with Christ. So sign up for the Biblical Counseling Conference that's coming up February 26th and 27th and learn how to become equipped to meet people where they're at and walk with them through their times of suffering and pointing them to Christ. Everyone here is a greeter. I know people that are here because someone greeted them and chased them down in the parking lot. All right? And I know, someone, I know some people that are here right now because, Sandra, you, you man that station right there and people love you. Everyone here is a greeter. Everyone here is a counselor. Everyone here is a member of the worship team. Everyone participates. And speaking of worship teams and stuff like that, Warren's been doing a great job. If you're interested in worship ministry, we'd love to know if you're interested in it. Also, we're going to be putting together like an Easter choir this year. I know some of you are excited about that, so stay tuned for that. And one of the best ways to get really plugged in is through membership. So I'm gonna ask uh, I'm gonna ask Tony and Carol and Shane. Where's Shane at? Is he he's back there? Come on up here. If you can stand right here, we're gonna move into a my time of membership. Um, I'm gonna invite Shane Hamstra and Tony and Carol Morgan, and you can just kind of stand right up here so everybody can see you. Today you're here because these people have expressed a desire to be all in with their fellow with the fellowship of disciples here at Faith Community Church. These people have demonstrated their commitment to the deepest level by going through membership classes. They've attended membership classes. They've agreed to our doctrinal statement. They shared with a team of our elders their salvation story. They've also committed themselves to live out the one another's of the New Testament with those that are gathered within the four walls here of this building. And the elders have collectively reviewed their testimonies and they're glad to invite them right up here to kind of show them off a little bit. These people were really excited to receive them into membership. These are going to be the new shiny members of FCC, right? Um, Shane Hamstra, put your hand up in the air. Everybody knows Shane. And then Tony and Carol Morgan, put your hands up in there. That's them, okay? Our new, yeah. <laughs> Our new shiny members. So, so, I, I, as their pastor, what I do is I aspire to uphold them in prayer, just like you would as well, that I would come alongside them and show them God's word in any and every situation, the Father's heart on whatever they're facing. I've, I've said this before, and I kind of joke around about it, but I, I'm really serious about this. Like, my job is to be the sheepdog on behalf of Jesus to shepherd your soul. Sheep need to be led and fed, and sometimes they need to be restrained and corralled for their own protection. And my job is not to lead or to feed or to corral or restrain. That's the job of the great shepherd. But I'm his sheepdog here, and so I'm gonna use, he's going to use me often as your pastor to do what only he can do. So I've joked about you being shiny new members, but you really truly are new shiny things. And so I want to give you these. This is what I kind of give out for new members. Now, I got one big one, and I got two small ones. So who do I like better? No, just kidding. Um, I give these to you because I want you to be new shiny things, okay? So new in the fact that God has said um, that your new creations are created in Christ Jesus, right? A whole new creation. And he says you're shiny, right? In Matthew chapter 5, he says, let your light shine like a city on a hill or like a lamp on a stand, right? And then, you know, I don't want to call you a thing, but you are a disciple. You are a, a lifelong learner, of Jesus Christ, and we want to do that together. And Paul says that if we commit ourselves to these things, then we can do so without grumbling or complaining. Then we can shine like stars in the universe as we hold out the word of life. 
in the midst of a crooked and depraved generation that everybody likes to grumble and complain. Let's not be like that. There's a lot of things to grumble and complain about. Look at all these people, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but let's commit ourselves to one another. And when we do that, when we live out the one another's of the New Testament, like Paul says, you're going to shine like a star in the universe. So I'm going to give you a little star and you a little star. And you're a really big star. There you go. That's, I'm sorry. <laughs> let's welcome our new members into membership. You guys can just... We want to maintain our shine, and so we must commit to a way of life around here that is less self-focused and more others-focused. We want to commit ourselves to practicing the one another's of the New Testament um, to everyone here. And you can see the verse there, do all things without grumbling or disputing or complaining, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine like lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life. So armed with that mindset, let's praise God once again for bringing Shane, Tony, and Carol into our membership. Let's go ahead. <laughs> Last little bit here. We talked about kind of a, like a lot of in-reach things, the ways to experience fellowship. We want to talk about outreach too. And uh, we're not going to talk about it today, but just know that it's on the radar. But today I want to make sure that we have a healthy body to receive broken and hurting people around us into, right? We got the Acts 2 fellowship. They, they devoted themselves to things to authentic Christian living, to exposing their needs and, 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 and letting people work on those things and be an answer to prayer, right? The Acts 2 fellowship was like a poster boy for the healthy body of believers, and as a result, we get a beautiful summary verse in verse 47. True Christian fellowship was occurring in Acts chapter 2, it was the perfect church for imperfect people. It was a safe place to bring people to into the fellowship of the body of Christ. And so Luke ends this section with these words. Look at this. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who are being saved. It doesn't happen unless it's a healthy body to be received into. And then the Lord will bless us. I don't care about numbers, but I care about numbers in the way that more souls are saved Are we going to be a safe place to bring people in into a fellowship of true, authentic Christian living where we do all things without grumbling and disputing, where we live our lives on purpose and intentional and like an open book to everybody? It's like, here, here's all the good, here's all the bad, here's the warts and all. Let's work on this together. And I think if we do that and we commit ourselves to that as a community, then the Lord will add to our number daily. I think he will. So, this could be us. Verse 47 could be us. So, have you ever been to a restaurant where you're completely stuffed, right? And then the wait staff comes up and asks you, do you want to see the dessert menu, right? You're like, yeah, yeah. You usually end up saying something like this. It's weird. It's like, man, that sounds amazing, but I don't know what, where I would put it. Yeah, it's like, they're like, put it in your mouth. You eat dessert, right? Like, it's easy, but... But you're like, no, I, I, I'm too full. Like, there's too much for me to digest, right? So we've already had the coffee and the biscuits and gravy here this morning. We're probably pretty full, but I want to give you something to, to take in. I wanted to make sure that I offer you the dessert, and I don't want you to forget to order it. So here, look at this cinnamon roll, okay? This is, look at this thing. Oh, my goodness. It is so good. It really, really is so good. It's the best, okay? Um, so... Anyway, there's, there's the cinnamon roll. So what, what is the dessert? Um, this is going to be short and quick, but I want to share something to you with you um, that has been so sweet to me. Um, this is one of the first concepts I learned as a Christian. Um, and unlike a sugar high, it's fueled and sustained me for a very long time now. And it's this verse that I am sure of this. I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. That is sweet to me, because there's many, many days that I don't feel like it's true. But Paul says, no, I, I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure of this. Your ability to stay on the straight and narrow path is only possible because God cannot lie. 
and he keeps his promises. He will finish what he started. Even when you doubt, even when you stumble, even when you fall, he will make good on what he said he will make good on. Romans 8, 30, 31 says, And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? No one. Not even yourself. You know... There was a period of my life where I kind of felt like the, the, the kind of the, the cliche Christianese that's out there sometimes, it kind of just felt like, ah, oh, I don't, you know, it's just kind of awkward or weird, right, or strange. But, you know, my mindset has changed over, when you live life a little bit and you go through a few things, your, your perspective changes a little bit, right? Footprints in the sand poem is no joke. It's not just wall art. The truth it contains fortifies the whole structure of your house. Listen to this. Nothing cheesy about this. One night I dreamed a dream. And as I was walking along the beach with my Lord, across the dark sky flashed scenes from my life. For each scene I noticed two sets of footprints in the sand, one belonging to me and one to the Lord. After the last scene of my life, my life flashed before me, and I looked back at the footprints in the sand, and I noticed that many times along the path of my life, especially at the very lowest and saddest times, there was only one set of footprints. This really troubled me, and so I asked the Lord about it. Lord, you said once I decided to follow you that you'd walk with me all the way. But I noticed that during the saddest and most troublesome times of my life, there was only one set of footprints. I don't understand why. Why, when I needed you the most, would you leave me? He whispered, My precious Child, I love you, and I will never leave you, never, ever, during your trials and testings. When you saw only one set of footprints, it was then that I carried you. I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will continue to bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. You and I are certainly carrying and shouldering a heavy load these days as we make our way through this life. But the shoulders and the back of Jesus once carried the cross beam that bore the weight of the sin of the world and it killed him. But then God completed that good work in him and rose Jesus from the dead. And he is now seated at the right hand of God. To be seated is to be in a position where you can simultaneously rule and reign And rest. So trust me when I say to you, He is enough to shoulder the weight that you carry. Zephaniah 3.17 says, The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save you. And he will rejoice over you with gladness, and he will quiet you by his love. And he will exult over you with loud singing. God's grace is. His favorable kindness that has been expressed to us in the past and continually expressed to us as we gather here today as the local body will one day be glorious expressed to us when he cracks the skies and he comes back for us. Because although we find ourselves in the throes of yet another year on this planet that is acquainted with much brokenness, we know that and we realize that our citizenship is in heaven and from it we await a savior, the glorious Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly bodies to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him to subject things, all things to himself. This is our future reality. Let that fuel all your efforts for godly living in 2022.
God, we're amazed that you are so gracious in giving us this most precious gift of Jesus Christ who has become for us our justification, our sanctification, and ultimately our glorification as we trust in you for these things. God, I pray that the little this and the little bit of that would have been like an appetizer and a in the main course and then the sweetness of a dessert to our palates here today, that we would recognize that you are doing a new thing. And we are the new creations in Christ Jesus, created for new works. I pray that we'd walk in them. I pray that we, your people that gather here, would be all in with each other and commit ourselves to doing the one another's of the New Testament, not just in form only, but in function as well. That the biscuits and gravy of, of this congregation would be our willingness to be committed to one another and to engage in true intimacy and authenticity in our relationships as we experience true Christian fellowship. And may as we walk the straight and narrow path be fueled by the idea and the reality that the Apostle Paul was sure of one thing. And that one thing was that you are a God who keeps his promises. And you have promised to never leave or forsake us. And you've promised to continue that good work and bring it to the day of completion when you come again. So God, I pray that you'd encourage your people. God, I pray that as we sing this last song, that you would bolster our faith, that we would recognize that if you are for us, then there is nothing that can stand against us. So we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.